All right, everyone, we are back in session, and it's really wonderful to see everyone here. I'm Trisha Rose, and I am a professor in Africana Studies here at Brown, as well as the director for the Center of the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, and I'm in the dean's office uh, here and there. I'm also on sabbatical, which is actually my most important identity. <laughs> <laughs> I should rewrite all my business cards on sabbatical, oh just and then use them all the time. Exactly. Um, but anyway, this is a wonderful, wonderful conference. We're really excited to be here. I'm uh, here with uh, Danielle Holly, who is uh, a, a new friend, yes. and we are uh, friends and colleagues of the most extraordinary Lonnie Guineer. And um, we're gonna have a conversation today sharing what our reflections are, what experiences we had, why she matters to us and why we think she matters so much to not just black feminism, not just African American studies, not just the legal field, but really to the world of ideas and to the future of democracy, quite honestly. It's not even Absolutely. too big a statement, in my opinion. So we're gonna, we've talked in advance a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, but we're gonna just have a, a, an open conversation. There will be time for questions and discussion as well. So I'm just gonna jump us right in, yes. Danielle. You ready to rumble? Yes, I'm okay. ready. Excellent. Um, so when we um, first started chatting, you very naturally sort of asked me a question that we then decided would be a great way to start. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of, what's our most vivid or first or earliest memory of meeting Lonnie or becoming acquainted with her or her work? I wanna invite you to say hello and, and also to share that first. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so honored to be here for this conference, honoring Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks, two of my intellectual heroes. And of course, uh, Lonnie was a professor of mine and just a teacher more broadly for me, even until this very moment. Right. Um, when I first encountered Lonnie was when I was a college student. So um, I went to Yale in the early 90s. This was right around the time of the confirmation fight, which we'll talk about a little bit more when uh, Lonnie was nominated to be the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights um, at the Department of Justice, and later President Clinton, of course, uh, took back that nomination, withdrew the nomination. Um, so she became an incredibly prominent figure to us during that time uh, when I was an undergraduate. So we had an incident on Yale's campus um, during the fall, I believe it was the fall of 1993, um, when William Buckley came to visit Yale. And during that speech, and it was for the Yale Political Forum, he said very frankly that he did not believe that black students had the intellectual firepower to be members of the Yale community. Um, he believed that policies like affirmative action uh, meant that there were people who were currently in the Yale community, most of them black and brown students, who really had gotten there uh, without deserving it. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, instead of, you know, we had first thought about, okay, should we protest the Yale political union? Should we do any of that? Instead, we decided to create a new organization which was called the Yale Black Political Forum. So myself and another student, we founded this organization. We went to the dean of the college and said, we really need money for this organization. And the dean asked us, well, who will come? You know, well, because there's nobody who, who can will, speak about You know, who will come to something and like this? <laughs> and so one of the first people we thought about was Lonnie. And we reached out to her, we told her what we were doing, and she right away said yes. And her showing up for us in that moment allowed that organization to start be incredibly vital and continue for almost a decade mm. on Yale's campus. And so that first moment was a sign of what Lonnie would be to me until this day, which is really a place of support, a place of light, a place of feeling that I had people who were before me, mm -hmm. right? And so I was so moved by the conversation with President Williams um, and President Simmons because they were demonstrating what it means right. uh, to meaningfully go before other people and do that in a impactful way. And that's what Lonnie really meant to me mm -hmm. from the moment that I encountered her. Yeah, what that, was the that's, first? That's wonderful, yeah. What was the first moment you remember encountering her? Well, the first time I met her was at a sort of a far-flung conference and I remember feeling too intimidated to really engage mm -hmm. with her, but the, because I was like, this, you know, I don't even know what to say, this was a long time ago, but the time that I really have the vi most vivid memory was 
um, in 2009, so I, my husband and I returned to Brown, or I returned, he came, I, <laughs> uh, in 2006. And th within three years, um, you know, there was a lot of debate and discussion about, um, you know, uh, sort of political issues around race. And there was a, there's a, 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 an event on campus called the Janus Forum, which was sponsored mm -hmm. by the Political uh, Theory Project. And Lonnie was debating a, a conservative who I can't even remember, sorry, uh, um, uh, about you know, affirmative action. And I remember watching her. First of all, I remember thinking, what patience, you know? I mean, it was just, you know, when, you know, when Ruth said, you know, she just had to try to spend time trying to control herself. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I just thought, I, I, I don't have the adequate patience. <laughs> but what was so remarkable was how unpersonally moved she was emotionally by irrational statements, yes. right? And so, so much of what has come up is how this sort of, I the injuries of managing being a non-white subject in various ways um, has, provokes a kind of outrage, right? And some of that I understand, but what Lonnie taught me immediately was, you don't have to be engaged with that. That's this right. is their issue. It's nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. This is, this is something you can respond to as if, they're not relevant to you. Exactly. To sort of perform that kind of outrage, in a sense, can take you off balance. Mm -hmm. And so I remember watching her just be careful, calm, measured, unruffled. And she didn't use it by using high, complicated speech, very right. everyday, accessible speech, very important. Um, and no pomp and circumstance. Because for her, it was always about the ideas. What's going to make this work? She would talk to anybody yeah. about anything if they were serious. She constantly moved away from, you know, talking about nonsense and, and right. circumstance. So in any event, those were my earliest memories with just how calm and comfortable and relaxed she was and unable to be provoked. Yes. Right? Um, so that, that's, that's one of my earliest memories. Um, the other question, you, you came up yeah. with this one too. You were the most generative member of our conversation, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, you asked me, you know, well, how did she inspire your work? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, yeah, I guess kind of everything I'm doing is kind of Lonnie Guinier-esque-ish following in her footsteps. So, but before, I want you to answer it first because I've just spoken, but yeah, I remember being so excited by that question. It was interesting because after we talked the other day, I really began to think about, so the next phase of my kind of meeting and understanding more about Lonnie was when she came to Harvard. Mm. So I went to Harvard Law School. She arrived shortly after my first year as the very famously the first woman of color to ever be, ever be tenured on the Harvard Law School faculty. It was a huge moment, I think, right. for the university, for the law school. But for me, it was an incredibly important moment because by then I had really begun to read her work in a way that I had not when I first met her. Um, I read Tyranny of the Majority. Mm. Uh, which was a collection of 1990 essays that were released after this confirmation battle um, about voting rights and voter suppression and about the principles of our democracy. And that was a collection of her law journal work. And I had read that. And then I read a piece that we'll talk about, I think, in a little bit more detail later, Becoming Gentlemen, um, that was about a one Ivy League school and the way that women felt in that law school environment. It was about Penn where she taught for a long time. And I struggled a lot my first year in law school. I'd always wanted to be a lawyer. And when I got to law school, I hated it. Mm. My first, and it shook wow. me to the core. Kind of what I believed I was meant to do, right. who I was, so much of that surrounded the law and being a lawyer, even though I had just entered law school. And so I reached for her work then, which was becoming gentleman, and I had a greater understanding of why I felt so alienated mm. and why I felt so displaced. Mm -hmm. And that for me, I wanted to do work like that. Yeah. I wanted to, from that moment, have all of my scholarship be scholarship that when people read it, they feel liberated by mm. it they feel that they've seen something that they hadn't seen before. Um, so my third year note, uh, which was very much inspired by Gerald Torres too, because it was about the Texas 10% plan that's a race neutral um, alternative. Oh, there's Gerald right there. Um, so he was, so when I was a law school student, 
myself and my, uh, my co-author, Delia Spencer, you probably don't even remember this, came to Texas, um, and Professor Torres met with us. I went back, I wrote my note, and then I gave it to Lonnie to read. And, you know, as everyone, we had this conversation earlier at lunch, that's a very scary moment. I don't think I realized how terrified I should be. If I had had better sense, I probably would have never given her my student note to read. She read it, I mean, just engaging in every word, mm. every paragraph, every thought. And what she said to me when she gave it back is she said, this is good student work. This is your work. Mm. And so I, I was kind of trying to figure it out, and I said, she goes, no, this is your work, meaning this is the work of the rest of your life. This is wow. not a student note. This is the work. And she was right. I think wow. from that moment, I understood, you know, that what I had done as a student note meant that I could write for the rest of my life about civil rights and education, about mm. opening the doors of opportunity to other people, mm -hmm. about ways to reframe and rethink things like affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And when she told me this was my work, she was so right. She saw it before I did. Wow. Do you think it was about, did you ever ask her what she saw or... Because, you know, yeah. I, I do think it's not just that you wrote a great student note, right? And yeah, that it was well-researched. Yeah. There's something she had to have felt and seen. I think seen what in it. she saw was just my unwillingness to accept the basis of the argument, right? Mm -hmm. So if affirmative action is supposed to be about merit and whether we use standardized tests and whether we use mm -hmm. GPA, I was willing to reject the basis of that argument and start at the beginning. Why do we believe some people belong and some people don't? Mm. Yeah. So she saw that once you were willing to do that, this yes. was not a kind of sort of upper, sort of not shallow, but not a simple engagement exactly. with the latest moment, but a fundamental reconsideration. Right. Exactly. Yeah. How has wow. she inspired That's your great. work? Well, you know, I went back after you said that and started looking through notes and exchanges between us and watched YouTube clips and, uh, and realized that the work I've been doing for the past eight or nine years uh, intellectually as well as at the Center at the Study of Race and Ethnicity very much mo is modeled after the way I see her interventions. The first thing is that ideas that are extremely important intellectually matter not just theoretically, but they matter most when they are engaged on the ground. Mm -hmm. When you can bring that kind of uh, serious engagement, right? you, don't, you don't let go of the intensity of what you're doing, but you translate it for a broader public because it matters so much. I mean, all of her work was extraordinarily accessible unless you were reading her legal scholarship, right. which I struggled through seeing as I did not go to law school, <laughs> you know, so she did not <clears throat> sort of use that kind of popular language exactly. in, in law journal pieces, but in the public realm, that was very important. So that's one thing, this vision of it, taking very important ideas um, and figuring out how to engage not only on the ground, but in a way that would motivate people to, to take it seriously. Um, the other thing that was really important for her was to create alternative framework frameworks, which is what you're, you, she saw you were doing. She did not begin in the middle. She said, well, what's, you know, who made the rules? This mm -hmm. was, you know, one of her, she said, when you're asking why things are the way they are, it's not just about, you know, what's going on. It's like, well, the rules are for someone. They're mm -hmm. not just randomly flawed. And it's through that question you begin to see, oh, there are sets of relationships that are, that are based on these, uh, on, on, on a hierarchy. Um, the other thing that was very important for her was the notion of interconnection. Right. And so all of these things are in the work I'm doing on systemic racism right now. I've been, you know, writing on it and I've been teaching on it for quite a while, but part of this sabbatical is, well, actually, all of this sabbatical has apparently been dedicated to two projects. One of them was very much about visibility to the public, creative engagement, and the other one's about it's hopefully making it visible and actionable on the ground. So I'm, you know, I'm, I hope I can live up to the quality of her legacy, Absolutely. but it's definitely been an inspiration for me. Yes. So we were going to talk a little bit about the confirmation fight and how yes. Lonnie first came into the memories of most Americans to the general public. 
and kind of talk about that. And right. I tried to today put my hair in a little side pony. It didn't quite work out, <laughs> which is one of the first things I remember about her public persona yeah. is this Afro puff yeah. that was kind of to the side. And I, I had never seen a black woman, a black woman lawyer, especially, right. where in the law we are taught that even the way I'm dressed today is very, you know, black, black, you know, with a little color here and there. You know, it's drilled into us to look certain ways. And that was one of the first things I remember about that confirmation mm. battle was I saw the beauty in her hair, but the comments that were made and the caricatures and the drawings and mm -hmm. all of those things. What do you remember about that confirmation fight? Well, I mean, the two things I remember simultaneously were the quota queen, yes. right, and and this this you know derogatory reframing, the refusal to engage with her ideas. She was against quotas, yes. right? But this this capacity, and of course, we've seen this over, over and, over, and over, right? This right. Re redefining what the freedom mm -hmm. movement yes. was about in the civil rights uh, uh, activism. And she basically was being attached to a concept she didn't agree with in order to to, for people to feel comfortable being hostile. And then this sort of, you know, strange hair, right? This strange hair. Now, you know, I, I, I just want to tell students, particularly if they're, you know, li watching from somewhere else, that it might, it might be hard given how much natural hair is in vogue for you to understand <laughs> what Lonnie's choice was, a, yes. what it felt like. Mm -hmm. um, it was virtually unheard of. It wasn't unheard just of. in the law. Right. Um, that it was unheard of. And for her to do it in the context of a, a, a political, you know, appointment mm -hmm. that would be so visible and to not change it under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. She didn't, you know, back down. I remember being really both moved by it and incredibly pissed off, obviously. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But I remember feeling that, that there was this constant drive to delegitimate her entire being yes. in order to uh, reject the ideas that they were threatened by because they ultimately couldn't argue with her. She was happy to argue with anybody. Right. I don't have that kind of patience. Mm -hmm. I'm just way too old and tired for that. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a limit on who I'm gonna spend exactly. my little bitty energy on. Um, but she would be like, yeah, no, let's, let's, you know, let's talk about it. But they didn't want to. So what did they do? They insulted her fundamental, fundamental being. Um, right. But I pulled a quote yes. from her uh, on this issue mm -hmm which she um, talks about her experience, and uh, I guess it was a few months later. She said, I endured the personal humiliation of being vilified as a mad woman with strange hair. Mm -hmm. You know what that means. A strange name and strange ideas. Ideas like democracy, freedom, and fairness that mean all people must be equally represented in our political process, Guineer said. But lest any of you feel sorry for me, According to press re reports, the president still loves me. He just won't give me a job. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh Lord. I like, <laughs> so, I mean. The, so, go ahead, please. <laughs> the quote that I read, I went back and read some of the quotes. The one that stuck with me was President Clinton's, mm. where he said, I never read her academic work and did Come not on, understand Come on, that man. she believed in quotas <laughs> when he knew yeah, that that just, just wasn't true, that her work never advocated for quotas. I couldn't believe it. I actually went back. You know, the New York Times has the time machine mm -hmm. where you can go back and read. I said, okay, I clearly need to read underneath this report. Mm -hmm. I went and, That was an actual quote. He claimed to have never read her academic work. Yeah. I mean, you know, for someone of her... Um, ethical commitment mm -hmm. for some of someone with her honesty and her her true commitment you know that's that's almost worse than just saying hey it look is. you know i just couldn't pull it off exactly you know? but just to disavow it and to claim mm -hmm. that it was something it wasn't and also to claim his own ignorance as if that was an excuse i mean yeah that's pretty but you know the clintons or you know <laughs> there are issues there um so um you mentioned this notion of interdisciplinarity yes I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that from a legal perspective, yeah. because you know, as someone outside 
legal circles, obviously, you know, interdisciplinarity feels different. So I'm curious, how, how did you come to that understanding of her work? You know, it's really interesting because I'm asked this question much more, especially now that I'm becoming a liberal arts college president. People are always asking me, so what do you think about the liberal arts? Why are you interested in being a president of a liberal arts college if you're a lawyer? And I always tell them being a legal scholar is inherently interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And that's a concept that I picked up from Lonnie, um, that it is very difficult to do serious legal scholarship if you are not willing to engage mm. with history, if right. you're not willing to engage with sociology, um, if you're not willing to engage with political science and all of the other disciplines. And I think what she demonstrated in her work, so again, and I know that they're going to talk about this on the next panel, but uh, Becoming Gentlemen, you see her doing work that looks much more like you would see in sociology mm -hmm. or what you would see in political science. And I think what I learned from that is the law is too limited for the kind of reimagining <sighs> that we must do to right. really create a more just society if you don't engage the other disciplines. Because really, reading the law, and I know that lawyers are going to hate me saying this, especially as a law professor, but the way that they want to teach you is a way that limits you. Right. They want you to read the law as it is and understand the law as it is. That's yeah, it. Take it. Take it as take a fact. Take the doctrine right. as it is learn that and then be able to repeat it. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in destroying the doctrine. Now that's not law school's job, I guess. Huh? No, <laughs> it is at Howard. Yeah. That's our job. Yeah. But All right. at the other law schools, that is not their job. At Howard, that is specifically what we do is we mm -hmm. teach people to understand the law engaged. to exactly mm -hmm. to be able to change the law mm -hmm. fundamentally. But if that's what your goal is, you have to engage. Right every other discipline that can help you in that project. So people like Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood mm -hmm. Marshall doing their work in desegregation, clearly they were engaging a lot of principles that they learned from sociology, for example, mm -hmm. of doing actual casework where mm -hmm. they went around to schools and learned about mm -hmm. um, what was happening in those schools on the ground in a way that law yeah. would never teach you to do. Right, right. I mean, I think what you're saying there um, isn't just about the legal profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, academia in general legitimates itself by acting as if ideas are received wisdom, right? That they are, in fact, a given. And disciplines are often defensive mm -hmm. about their own boundaries because their legitimation comes from having students and professors, you know, respond with that, you know, can sort of uh, wisdom, right, from, from what they think that the field yeah. should be. Um, and, and so her interdisciplinarity wasn't limited to that, but she, I, I think she intervened ultimately in many disciplines as a result. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about her problem solving interdisciplinarity yes. and her creativity um, because, you know, she was just, you know, she was a roll up your sleeves type of let's fix this Absolutely. person. Again, as soon as you started BSing, she was moving along. So mm -hmm. you had to stay on the work and she was, real, she had energy like, I, I just get sleepy thinking about, I mean, she could just stay with it for so long. But she was an amazing uh, sort of role model for me when I took over the Center for the Study of Race yes. and Ethnicity. And we, we talked about this mm -hmm. a little bit. And, um, you know, I took over a center that uh, had been kind of unfunded or underfunded previously and didn't have much of it. It wasn't, I, I didn't walk into an agenda. I had to kind of create it. And Lonnie and I were on the phone talking. I was like, well, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'll have to figure this out. And she, within, within a year of those early conversations, um, reached out and said that she had some, some resources that were left over from a large grant that she had won and that she wanted to host a conference and would I be interested in collaborating, which was really her way of saying, let me come down there, help you mm -hmm. out, get your act together. <laughs> I love that. And give you something to do with some legitimacy. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, sounds like a great idea, <laughs> <sounds> great. <laughs> I'm like, I can do that. And so we came up, we started really thinking about work that she was doing more broadly about criminalization and the, the ways in which the conversation about mass incarceration for, for African Americans was not in adequate intellectual dialogue with the kinds of immigration detention centers and boundaries that these uh, forms of sort of racially targeted criminalization were producing. 
So we came up with this title called Seeing With My Two Eyes, and eyes were letter eyes for immigration and incarceration. Gerald knows this because we, we had a great time. So we, we, we decide, decided to bring scholars and activists from both areas, the two eyes, to really talk together about, you know, how can we build a language that would bring a collaboration, political collaboration, on the ground as well as in the academy and conceptually so that th these detention centers, which this is 2012, something like that, mm -hmm. so it's only got much worse, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, to see how we could be politically responsive. Um, so um, in addition to the conference, she had this whole creative component mm -hmm. where she brought uh, people who did basically bo bodily enactments of key concepts. So um, I, right now I can't think of one. I'm going to rely on Gerald to yell from the audience at yes. some point. Boal's the, right, the, the model, but what were some of the concepts we did, Gerald? I, you know, well, take your time. I'll tell, I'll tell the story. In the, I can't yes. think of one right now. I, but basically, if, imagine something like, um, like affirmative action yeah. or something solitary like. Solitary confinement. So, right, solitary yes. confinement or, you know, other things mm -hmm. like that. But also politically generative concepts like talented 10th Tenth, or, right. you know, how would you model, what would this physically look like? How would we physically engage? Mm -hmm. So we, we watched a documentary called The House of I Live In, which was about mass incarceration, and then the audience was invited to participate in these uh, Boal-inspired performances. So if they have the slides, I, yes. I had some stills made of, so this was at the conference, because, you know, Lonnie was always like, well, look. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the next one, I think, is the one that, yes. okay. So I wish I could tell you what concept this was, mm -hmm. but it had something to do with the relationship yeah. between people who were wishing things were different mm -hmm. and people who were suffering simultaneously, mm -hmm. sort of back to back. Um, and, you know, Lonnie was in it all the time. Yeah. Just one, I think there's one other, maybe two other That's pictures. That's with Breon. Oh yeah, that was Breon Bain. Oh wait, yes. go back a second. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so there's D Breon. the other day. Mm -hmm. So this is Breon Bain, who was also in your uh, mm -hmm. went to law school. We went to law school together, together yeah. and he wrote an amazing, long spoken word uh, performance art on how he was um, intentionally misidentified as someone who had a warrant out for him, and yes. they literally jailed him. And when he said he was a Harvard Law student, they actually said he was mentally insane because mm -hmm. this couldn't be possible. They brought right. in a psychologist to literally put him in a, in a, a prison that was a psych, a psych ward. And, and when they brought him to court, this is the, the, the story behind the whole thing, the actual lawyer on the other side also went to law school with him and told the judge, no, no, he really did go to Harvard Law School with me. So the whole thing is about how he turned that into this amazing play. So he yeah. came and, and debuted that for us and we talked mm -hmm. about how to really tell these stories. Um, next slide. Um, so this, this had to do with, you know, thinking through, you know, the, the sort of, the, the shame of containment and mm -hmm. confinement, if I remember properly. And I think there's one other last slide or is that it? That must be it. So, um, you know, this is Lonnie, you know, with students coming out of the audience, exactly. you know, really connecting with people. It's interesting because one of the things about the power of the way that Lonnie taught was that she passed these concepts on. So Breon came and did this with my students mm. about two or three years ago. And, you know, I think that that is incredibly special. When you teach right. in a way that doesn't just benefit your students, but it's also interesting that in Becoming Gentlemen, she names the survey in mm. Becoming Gentlemen the Bartow survey, which was named after one of her students who then became a law professor who wow. mentored me. Wow. So in that way, she's everywhere, yeah, right? She's it's here. one of the things that I think is something that I most admire about and hope to and aspire to is that her teaching doesn't end in the sense that when she does something like engage in the way that we just saw in those pictures, it allows generations of students mm -hmm. to benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, she's, she's been remarkable in that. Um, before we go to this next, yeah. the last sort of semi-last topic, mm -hmm. which we were talking about, her our, our two sort of favorite books, but also her sort of vision for mm -hmm. today. I wanted to say one quick thing, which is about her biography. You know, her father, right, went to Harvard, but and then basically dropped out because right. of racism. 
um, and she saw herself as going back to Harvard with, a, with an agenda for that. But I want to read that two ways, because I think it's important. I think celebration is critical, right. but I also think it's important to say that, you know, Lonnie was, came into this profession, you know, it was, it was the family business That's in right. a sense. Right, um, and that allowed her to have a certain kind of confidence that she was hoping to give everyone, but she knew everyone didn't have it, mm -hmm. right? And she was honest about that. She and she didn't have any. She's like, look, the truth is the truth. You know, uh, uh, Ruth's, Ruth's point is quite right here. The lies are the lies, and the truth is the truth, and that's true about us as it is about everyone Absolutely. else. And Lonnie had no problem talking about colorism, being mixed race, you know, and I, we talked a lot about mm -hmm. those things because we share those traits and being from New York. Um, and she, I do not, however, have any, any family business in higher education. Um, but that, I think, I, I really respect that about her because some people want to posture that they're That's sort of in a position they're not in because they think their credibility comes from that. Mm -hmm. And Lonnie didn't do that. And I, again, so it's both a, a celebration, yes. but I think it's also about, hey, look, you know, she had the tools and, and those things were important. And, and that's not to say anything negative, it's just reality. Um, so tell me about your favorite book and why, and, and what, what of hers was moved it's, you so. It's so funny, because at first I said tyranny of the majority, and then after our conversation the other day, I said, Miner's Canary is also you a huge fan. I'm not going to take yours, though. Yeah, we don't. So I'm not going to take yours. We were, you know, <laughs> we're doing well, no, so I'm not going to take yeah, we yours. We can both do Miner's. Yes. No, we can both I'm going to do, do tyranny of the majority. There's plenty in there's, there's Plenty. So I think the thing for me about tyranny of the majority is that the struggles and the real crisis that we're having in our democracy mm -hmm. right now, during her confirmation fight, they claimed that her work was radical because it talked about the limits of our current democracy and the way that majority mm -hmm. rule can actually cause the end of democracy. Right. And instead of being something that turned out to be, you know, this radical idea, instead she saw it way ahead. So if we think now mm -hmm. about the destruction of the Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. uh, through Shelby versus Holder and other cases, right. the new rise in all of these voter suppression laws, everything that she saw happened. Right. And so, again, it's one of those things that most scholars, and especially I'll say legal scholars, we are not ready to step back for far enough mm -hmm. from what people say are the presumptions that cannot be disturbed. Right. Majority rules. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to step back from that, then it opens up the door to what are the fundamental problems. And because we didn't heed her warning, we see what the result of that is right now, which is really our democracy is on the ropes. Right, right. Yeah, no, that, that's really true. That's really true. And she, you know, it's, it's really a, an extraordinary thing to think that um, she came to that, and many scholars, mm -hmm. not her alone, Derek right. Bell and of others, course, came yes. to this because they were able to imagine that the world was fundamentally unjust as yes. we know it and that the laws are help, helping reproduce it, but the answers are not in necessarily ending the That's entire right. process, but really challenging its, its sort of technical implementation. So what do you think you would say about tyranny um, in terms of today? I mean, what, what was one of the biggest insights, since I know you love that book, yeah. that you can see playing out today? I, mean, I think one of the things that I wish we had more of, it's, you know, it's something that I miss about her already and that we don't see a lot in our current scholarship, is the uh, willingness to engage with the real problems. So that sounds a little strange. No, that no, I scholarship think, yeah, yeah, say more. would yeah. not engage with what we're actually seeing on the ground. And I think what I loved about her scholarship in Tyranny is perfect for the, because it's a, it's a collection of law journal articles that are typically not accessible mm. to people. No one reads law review articles. If three people yeah. read them, you're happy. Um, so the idea that this would turn into something that's widely read, including by college students, which is when I first um, read mm. it, I think that is something that is missing. Um, right. This ability to say, okay, what is one of the big problems in being willing to take a swing, mm -hmm. multiple swings, 
That's really true. Yeah. You know what, I, I was thinking a lot about that problem mm -hmm. right now, which is that on the one hand, we have more what I'd call public conversation about race and inequality yes. and less scholarly public yeah. engagement about race. And so yeah. there's, there's a broader public writing, yeah. but most of them are not coming out of the exactly. academy. They are, you know, journalists and writers mm -hmm. in general, tremendous insights. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for scholars who've spent decades studying these critical fundamental issues, right, exactly. around the organization and mechanisms of democracy, mm -hmm. for them to, to, to retreat from the public when we are in just, mm -hmm. the house is more than on fire. You know, it's nearly charred to the ground already. Absolutely. And w people are still writing, you know, navel-gazing articles that three people are gonna read and they're not even collecting them in a, in a, right. a book, let alone really having, a, you know, major impact in public. It's, it's, it's really a shame. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, she's someone, and when we think about remembering people and, and commemorating them, which we'll turn to in a minute, mm -hmm. you know, I think she's a role model for how important it is for this kind of intellectual work to be understood as the kind of fundamentally political work that it is. Yes. Right, no matter what take mm -hmm. you have, it's fundamentally political. For me, Miner's Canary was just yeah. like this. First of all, I adore the metaphor, mm -hmm, and you know, me I, I know it's a mess. I repeat it all the time. I always, you know, cite her. But um, *Miner's Canary* uh, is a is uh, a book that attempts to really figure out how we develop a different way of thinking about a racial identity as a political identity, right? right? And to establish something that she and Gerald, uh, as co-authors, who's amazing in his own right, and also the fact that she was a collaborator, like yes. that's hard Everyone, to do. Oh my gosh, I can really article. write with myself. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. So I keep giving her credit for you know becoming gentleman, but that was a co-authored article. Yes, she yeah. loved to collaborate. I mean, yes, and right, she really did, and she did it well, and she picked brilliant mm -hmm, people, you know. So, um, so Miner's Canary is is about the thinking through. What does it mean? How are we all going to get along? I mean, which is, I mean, I don't mean like, you know, Rodney Not King's Rodney version King of that question. Version, right. I mean, Ruth's pr mm -hmm. question, which is, look, diversity is not just some sort of agenda. It is the, the future of our stability mm -hmm. depends on how we deal with that. And part of Lonnie and Gerald's interest there was about establishing a category of political races and identities. And that's one of the ways out of the illusion of a fixed racial binary that somehow white equals this, black equals that, they're monoliths. And it's saying, no, look, we have political choices to construct our racial identities and all of the other convoluted identities that intersect and transform who we are into a politically active understanding of the, of the way race has been historically produced to produce us and then and, and work that out. So this was really important to me because, you know, it's very easy to get stuck, you know, in the, exactly. what you think of the fight is. And I said, like, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of freedom in this mm -hmm. if you really deal with it right. But the second thing is the miner's canary metaphor, which right. is exactly where we are, as you pointed out, much worse now, which is um, this, this uh, uh, experience where uh, coal mine uh, com companies you know, dig deep into the earth to extract, you know, precious metals and, and energy sources. And as the oxygen wanes, uh, obviously this would threaten the lives of the, of the coal miners. So they send some poor bird, a canary down there, who has a more fragile lung capacity, and they use it as a, bed, a bellwether. When the canary dies, they know that the actual coal, the, the coal mine workers will not survive down there soon soon enough. So they're kind of the front runner, right? Mm -hmm. But she said, well, you know, instead of thinking about this is the time when the coal miners should leave, right? She said, what if we understand this as a circumstance that is going to kill us all? Because right. we're not all going to be able to leave if we understand this in terms That's of right. the country. And so here we are with this sort of trickle down crisis where the middle class and the upper middle class and whites themselves are part of this um, you know, reactionary response, partly because they're the miners right. who are still locked in the, in, the, in the coal mine. And she was really, I think, able to understand our interdependence. So rather exactly. than thinking of this as a sacrifice, uh, right, that, that there to was- To think of it as interdependence. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I wonder how much, I, I hope that many students right now are reading Miner's Canary. Yeah, it's really brilliant for, the, for where we are, especially political race and, exactly. 
and our, and our mutual interdependence. Because yeah. remember I said interconnected. interconnected. She didn't say we're interconnected and there are no differences right. or we're all the same. Mm -hmm. She said we're interconnected and there are all these kinds of hierarchies and complexities exactly. and we need to figure it out. I mean, she was one of the first people to, uh, you know, really talk about the complexity of the changing nature mm -hmm. of the black community. Absolutely. Right? There's a lot of anxiety about, like, never talking about it. She's like, well, there are no African-American students at Harvard. Where'd they go? Right. I was like, Lonnie, I, I was like, Nellie McKay. I was like, girl, <laughs> are you yes. done lost your Do mind? You really want to talk <laughs> about that? I'm not going down that road. Exactly. But she's really right, because, the, mm -hmm. because that's going to be a political issue that will be used against you know, people of African descent working in, in collaboration. But Lonnie went straight to the, hey, this is, this is gonna be an issue, we need to deal with it Absolutely. Um, constantly. Um, so I just want us, us to, in con, sort of general conclusion before we open it up to a general questioning and discussion, although we don't have answers to your questions, we would just yeah. listen. <laughs> We're gonna engage your we'll questions, engage, We will engage and discuss. Yes. Um, but um, we started thinking about why events like this are important. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Belle is extraordinary in her own yes. right, in, for all kinds of ways, very different than Lonnie, if mm -hmm. you think of them as, as, as thinkers and as people, uh, individual personalities. But I've been thinking a lot about the loss of, co uh, what makes collective memory happen, yes. what kind of collective memory we have, and what's our responsibility in crafting a collective memory that is you know, truthful, full, uh, honest, and also keeps legacies alive. Exactly. Because one of the things I really worry about is that race is everywhere and, it, and, and insight about it is almost nowhere. No. Yeah. And, and what that does in the public sphere is create a context in which we assume we know things we really don't know. Right. And so we come to uh, responses as a nation around race that I think is pretty tragically you know, shallow and people think they know everything, that we've solved this, we've solved that. And part of it is because the collective memory of all of the scholars and activists mm -hmm. who come before have largely been, I don't want to say contained, but their value has been appreciated and, and taught in only African American studies, Africana, black exactly. studies, critical race theory, mm -hmm. a black feminism. And as a result, people who don't take those uh, niche courses, and I use that with tremendous sarcasm, yes. um, are, are actually d manipulating the, uh, the collective memory of, of who mm -hmm. we really should be. Yeah, I started last year working on just trying to understand all of the laws that are being passed that are labeled as anti-critical race theory. Right. And when I began to read the actual language of the laws, what struck me is that Florida and Texas, Texas was even more interesting in some ways, Florida has become more well known, right. is all this language about things that make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. or reporting you right. know, language that can make you uncomfortable. Right. And I was like, isn't that the entire goal? Right of education to you know help you right. to understand more things that will liberate you and part of liberation is becoming uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In and all I, different kinds of ways. In all different kinds of ways. And then when we started to really think about so looking specifically at the African American studies A P mm -hmm. and what they're trying to do to Africana studies, when you saw the things that were struck out Right. It was so clear that they are the things that talk about interdependence. Yep. Right. There was no mistake that it's bell hooks that's right. being struck, that it's Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. Even the word intersectionality right. is specifically being attacked, and that's because that is the project. Right. Right? right. The project is erasure. The project is to erase memory, to mm -hmm. erase the work of people right. like Bell Hooks and Lonnie right. Guineer. So when we're here, this is a political act mm -hmm. to be here right. and to celebrate their memories because we refuse to have them erased. Right, and, and yet we, we want to pass on, right? Yes. Because unfortunately, you know, well, Lonnie and Bell are gone, you know, our futures are not, my future's not that far away, I'm not 25, you know. So we want the young anymore. people to yes. know that that past is not guaranteed in your memory mm -hmm. and collective memory. Right. It has to be fought for and re-remembered and fought for again. And, and it's very easy to completely lose sight and oh, I, of these things. One of the things that I, I was reading, and we talked about this briefly, I think it was in, I think it was this week in an op-ed piece about um, the burial grounds of the yes. enslaved being reburied underneath 
buildings and parking lots. And you know, on the one hand, you might think, you know, well, what does it really matter? You know, that we don't know where former, uh, formerly enslaved, you know, African people are are buried. But when you think of burial grounds, their job is to tell us about our ancestors, who came before, and who were we mm -hmm. in various places. And right now, basically, you know, m almost all of the six million black people who died enslaved in the U.S. are buried under parking lots, literally mm -hmm. under buildings. Yeah. And, the, and the question is why, right? Why? Because the drive is to forget. Mm -hmm. The drive is to deny. The mm -hmm. drive is to erase. And it's not just about the bodies, it's about what kind of memory are we going to have. So, you know, this is really vitally important work, as right. much for tomorrow and the tomorrow after that than it is for today, right? Um, so for me, that's, you know, that's really what makes me want to be a part of this, to think about Lonnie's impact is not just the fun of thinking about her and saying how much I miss her, mm -hmm. but just like, you know, this is really where it's gonna be. It's, it's in, the, in the memory of who has worked for us, mm -hmm. you know, to make it possible. Um, I think there's one other thing. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, we, we, we did that already. I won't go into yeah. that. Um, did you have any thoughts in closing that you wanted to share before we yeah, I just, throw it I, open? I really, you know, hope that one thing that comes from today is that people who are watching and who are hearing us talk about Lonnie, that they, you know, take up her spirit. I loved, uh, Evelyn was telling a story uh, at lunch about Lonnie engaging with her child and what that engagement was like. And I've said too often, you know, we're not interested in what children think. We're not truly, sometimes I stop myself when I'm with my students and I'm busy doing 15 other things and to hear Ruth mm. Simmons talk about, I wanted to be with my students. I hope that that fundamental engagement yeah. with ideas, mm -hmm. with our students, right. with theory, mm -hmm. with practice, that all of that uh, is something that we continue on. Yeah. In not just, I think, in a very kind of rote, this is our responsibility way, but to feel that it is really a, you know, a life's mission, that it is really our purpose. Um, yeah. as to why we're here. And so that's, you know, for me, what I take away from the work of these two incredible scholars yeah. is that that sense of this being, we were talking about full integration of life, mm -hmm. that this isn't something that stops when we, you know, step away from the podium. Right. Or right. when we stand up and go back into the audience, but mm -hmm. that it is something that defines us and defines our work and defines our lives and defines the struggle. Yeah. No doubt, no doubt. Well, we're we're just. I, uh, I'm eager to hear that story, Evelyn. So maybe, maybe in the next session you yes. can sneak it in so we can all learn about it. Um, so we're happy to talk yes. and learn and listen from everyone here in the audience. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I think I'm not sure who's moderating the, the audience questions. Yes. Who's I am. I just found out I'm moderating. <laughs> yes, and yeah, we have the mic that's uh, right okay. here if you need it. And I think we can take questions from online too. I believe no. that the. Oh, we can't. Oh, okay. we're not able we to can't. do that. Okay. Okay. So yes, this is in one. the room only. Yep, yes. There's one right there. Gotcha. Thank you for seeing that. I can't see a thing. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Thais Benham Hickman. I'm the executive director of the Leadership Alliance, and uh, we're a consortium. Uh, aimed at increasing underrepresented talent who are pursuing PhDs. And our mission really is to train, mentor, and inspire uh, the next generation of leaders. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, how do we continue to inspire, um, you know, and also mm -hmm. increase enthusiasm for those to come back to the academy? Because we see a lot of students who go on to obtain PhDs, but then they go elsewhere, um, and I think it's so important to, to have that scholarship, and like you said, to, to keep the legacy alive, and mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of inspiring students to remain in the academy so that we can hear stories like this from, from our scholars. Mm. Yeah. Um, th that's a really good question. So, I would, um, 
boy, this is. Um, I would say that we have to challenge, you know, higher education to really live up to the mandate around educating people for the purposes of participating in a multiracial, multigendered, multi-class democracy, and that that job means creating a curriculum that fuels, you know, the kinds of engagement and self-reflection and challenges that are going to be alive in the world, right? Not, not necessarily the most uh, sort of creative theoretical concept that is virtually impossible to trace back into everyday practice. So the first thing is, I think, to help the academy be a place that people want to engage because they think they're going to learn about the world as they want to be you know, in it, right? But I think the other thing is part of the battle over the AP phenomenon, even though AP is, a, is really a stand-in for forcing people to teach African American history at all, forget AP, you know, advanced, how about just placement? <laughs> you know, like, we don't know any advanced placement. You know, there's literally very little, you know, conversation during the whole, just a quick aside, during the whole George Floyd, you know, racial reckoning, which, you know, I put, put in quotes, um, people would say things like, you know, in Juneteenth, like, you know, I'd never heard of Juneteenth. I was like, well, you know, there's whole curriculums about this, right? People can go through all kinds of, all the way through higher education and never learn about Juneteenth, which seems tiny to me. Tulsa Massacre, I've never heard about that. It's like, okay, so we're doing Afro-Am 101 over here. Um, where is that curriculum? So if, if high schools are, are engaged with that curriculum, that's going to bring people into colleges who are going to bring people into the profession, right? So there's, there's whole educational legacies that exclude that information. Um, and I think students need to play a really important role in demanding that the universities and high school teachers and so on really tell them what they need to know. Right, and, and they do it on other things. I think they really are gonna have to be, be proactive in that way. Um, and that means changing the mission of sort of higher education to be just about a status production machine for greater standing, to win awards, to win you know, labels and titles. Again, that's something Lonnie was completely uninterested in. She would have been doing everything she was doing at any institution or no institution. The same thing's true of Ruth. She, you can put her anywhere. She's going to tell you exactly. what, 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 you know, anywhere. So to me, that's, that's how I would recommend yeah. creating that energy. I would say for me, two just pieces of advice from my own career that I tend to give to people who, um, especially scholars of color, when they want to go into the academy is just that find some place to be if you can, right? And this for me, I, I really have connected to all the institutions I've taught at, but my, um, my, com my career, my life really changed when I, when I uh, went to Howard. And I think what I found at Howard that is very special to me, and I think I, I'm, I definitely, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about joining Mount Holyoke, is that for me it was a place where I could think the kind of ideas that are most exciting to me and have them really mean something to the students that I'm teaching and to the communities that those students come from. And I think the reason that a lot of scholars, that a lot of PhD students, a lot of law students, a lot of professionals do not think that, uh, that being an academic is good for them is because they don't see the connection to you know, really making a difference in the lives of the communities of the people that they care about the most. We feel disconnected mm -hmm. from those communities. And I think when we teach in spaces, and, and you can make that space wherever you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at University of South Carolina, I made that space with lots of other black faculty who came to the university at the same time. But is it a space in which you're doing academic work that really matters in the lives of people who need us the most, who need us to address these issues of justice and of equity? That, to me, is what powered me for it. The second thing is the academy can be incredibly exhausting. <laughs> Emotionally 
spiritually exhausting. And I think, again, for scholars of color, we are asked to do so many other things. We used to call it, um, in my first uh, academic appointment, we would actually call it minority taxes, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all the committee service, all the mentoring, all the, and we have to demand of everyone in our environment that they do that work. I know it's very difficult. Many people are not qualified to do it, don't feel qualified to do it, but the more we continue to do it, the less and less of us there will be. Right. right. And you see academics who are young dying early. You see people burnt out. You see people getting sick. You see all of these things, and it's partly because we are taking all of this on. We cannot make the profession one in which it will cost you everything to to do your job, right? So we have to open this space to more people and say this is your responsibility too, and if not, we're not going to continue to shoulder. I know that that's a very difficult thing to say, but to say that this can't be what we are only responsible for, especially not at this point. Let's face it, we've been doing this work now for 60, 70 years now, you know, in terms of creating, mm -hmm. uh, trying to create diverse space, we can't continue to do it in the same way. Yeah, no, yeah. And, you know, again, some of that is about not being obsessed with hierarchy. Yes. Go to places, you know, and, and it's not about only learning in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We need, there's so much technology for, you know, free, sort of freedom schools, mm -hmm. as it were. We have to take this curriculum on the road, right? Absolutely. And be really serious about that, because as, as, as um, you know, Crystal said earlier, mm -hmm. you know, this is the, the language students are using is the language that, that the world wants them to use. I mean, they, of course, come up with their own and they're changing it, mm -hmm. but they have to fight for a language that they're trying to craft without us having helped necessarily give them all that they need. So I Absolutely. think th that's another piece of what I think you're saying. Yeah. yeah. That's really helpful. Evelyn. Um, of course, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, I, I just want to go back to the point you made earlier, Trish, and I think you made it a couple of times today, about a particular role that higher education needs to play right now, our scholars in the academy needs mm -hmm. to play right now, mm -hmm. that we're letting be filled by um, journalists, by other folks who have a particular, who bring a kind of, they might bring a historical perspective, but it's a, right. it's a particular and specific kind of, historical perspective, it doesn't carry the weight, it doesn't do the same work that people who have, as you said earlier, studied this stuff for a really long time and understand the ups and downs that, in ways, which uh, one thing we would all say, those of us who've done African American history, of course there was gonna be a backlash. It, it was just a matter of when. It was just a matter of when, it wasn't like, it, there wasn't, it wasn't gonna happen. So, but how do you think that uh, um, we try to tell students that this moment is in many ways expected, if not mm -hmm. inevitable. But then what? Mm -hmm. And and right. where and where are we in this? Because you know, mm -hmm. in the last few weeks, we've been signing a lot of letters. We've yes. been mm -hmm. protesting. We've been we've mm -hmm. been you know um, trying to figure out how we can convene, how we can hold some institutions accountable for the harm that they're doing right now in the face of a absolutely explicit mm -hmm. attack. Right. Um, what are we going to do? Right, right. Well, a couple of things. You know, Ruth was, I think, very helpful to mm -hmm. me in this in this context. Her answer was, look, we knew this was coming. And then she didn't say, so why are we acting all surprised and draining our energy about the, the what? You know, affirmative actions, no, we still have racism. We're going to show you. Instead, what I read her to be saying is new things are going to come up. We don't know what they are yet. And I'm like, oh, well, let's be part of that. Let's be part of saying, okay, affirmative action was never going to last. We knew that actually at the time, at least from the reading that right. I have, have done on it. And the, the question of not only what's possible now, but what do we need now? What might this moment look like? How do we uh, recruit young people to be part of helping us figure that out? Because, you know, they're, they're going to have to live with it. And be um, sort of, to be less emotionally uh, uh, sort of pushed off balance by that which we already know. And that's really important to role model for young people. Because for, I know in our generation, violence would happen and you'd read about it. Now you see it and hear it all the time and it can be very, dis force you to pull out, disengage, or just also collapse from psychic stress. 
So to be able to say, hey, look, we're going to do, we're going to look at the future, and it's, I'm going to model the way Lonnie did, the way Ruth does, that this is not something that is going to control my emotional engagement. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other thing is that we need to challenge universities to not just tolerate the study of race with Africana studies programs, but to, and, and, and so on, same thing with ethnic studies and gender studies and so on, but to say that these are um, anything that helps us create and restore a, a world, or not restore, because it never existed, but um, to create and um, help build an environment in which we support the development of, you know, human, you know, uh, harmony of some sort, that that's a requirement in our discipline. So departments should not be able to get away with having 100 courses and none of them that relate to the crises of the world. So it's almost like having an environmental studies mm -hmm. field that doesn't deal with climate change. It's like, really? How can you have a history department, a philosophy department, a, you know, a so-and-so department? It doesn't matter what the discipline is. And those challenges are not about saying, hey, you have to study race with a prerequisite. It's about saying, this is a crisis in the world when there are many of them. And our curriculum needs to prepare people not just to run corporations and ven venture capital outfits, but to prepare them for figuring out how to build this thing that we have not yet built. That's a really good question. Thank you for that. But I, Ruth, Ruth was probably my best uh, support. Did you have a? I think the only thing I would add is that, and again from Ruth, I think this ability to be practical and to speak plainly. So it has. I should not be as surprised as I am that the what I consider to be relative silence about the fact that now over 13 states have passed what are clearly just censorship and book banning laws. And yet, for two years, we've been talking about them as anti-critical race theory. Right. They're not anti-critical race theory bills. They're censorship and book banning bills that target <coughs> black authors. They target Jewish authors. They target women. Right. And, and, queer, you, and queer. And queer authors. Mm -hmm. It is something that everyone who believes in public, and it's an attack on public education. Right. Too. So in the state of Florida, 50% of students who go to school in the state of Florida are black and Latinx, mm -hmm. which means that this is an yeah. attack on the education, publicly yeah. funded education. But you, the way that I just said it, how many times have you heard it said Never. that way on TV right. or on right. social media or on podcast? Anything that can get to people to get right. them to start and take action Instead, the void that is there is being filled by people who literally stand in front of microphones with no shame and say, this curriculum that teaches that black people were oppressed is bad for students. It is not true. Right. right. And it's it makes teaching, them feel bad. It makes people feel bad. I'm like, who? Yeah, we're not concerned. Yeah. It, but they are standing in front of microphones completely unashamed. Right. And who are the people standing in front of the other microphones? Right. And what are they saying when they get to those microphones? Right. Cause and, it, yeah. yeah. This is the, the, the other thing that, that makes this so important is that, you know, as Carter G. Woodson said, mm -hmm. you know, what you, if you control what a person thinks, you, you don't have to worry about what they're going to do. Absolutely. So if you have 50% of a state that's trying to establish an agenda of restoring, you know, a southern, mm -hmm you know, lost cause sort of agenda. Um, it's going to be much harder to do that if there's a, any kind of historical examination of race and, mm -hmm. and, and, and class as an intertwined matter, Absolutely. you know, in the curriculum, because they won't know. And if they don't know, they won't pay. It'll be, it'll be like another, you know, parking lot exactly. on top of, on top of, a, of, of, a, of a burial site. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important. Thanks for that. I think we have another question over here. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Hello. yes. Um, you know, I really love uh, Miner's Canary, yeah. and I, um, what I really love about it is the fact that it opened up possibility for new coalition, definition, you know, the ability to bring people together in ways that we had not imagined before. I think about the Texas case that you talked about. There was another um, story that was illustrated about um, union workers coming together. Um, I forgot what the plant was, but it's been a while since I read the book. But I just, I, you know, I don't, oftentimes we read there's a diagnosis of the problem, 
but exploration of possibility sometimes is missing from the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you guys could speak a little bit more about, you know, the way in which Monty and Gerald were able to reimagine the world as you also are doing, that process of reimagining and figuring out different ways to approach coalition building and a mm -hmm. different structure for our world, trying to un hook our minds from the way we are structurally thinking about the world now, mm -hmm. giving us new language to imagine a different structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that is really. Yeah, I think, you know, I, one of the focuses of my work is I rarely write any law journal articles that are not, do not include a, something that I believe is new in terms of a solution, right? Because I do think that when you do that best kind of work, like Miner's Canary, it always is going to provide a framework for thinking about how do we begin to solve the problems that we've described and diagnosed and really, you know, been able to identify. So how do we do that? I think the first thing is to believe that that is part of the work of our scholarship. Right. And so some of it is that we are told, for example, at least in my field of scholarship, that many times, you know, that the normative part of what you do, it should be there, but a lot of the things seem completely to me, I read lots of articles and I'm like, this seems disconnected from any sense of reality. And so right. I think... when it's done in the best way, it is real examples of, look at the way that this labor union came together to make conditions in this field better. Look at the way that when black and brown parents joined together in this particular school district, that they were able to change curriculum. You do have to begin to think about our work. Again, to me, it's most powerful when it's connected to the community that we most want to help. And I think now what is the crisis is that there is this, and Ruth was describing it perfectly, just this pitting against each other to the point where people say there is no solution. I think that the creation of despair, so for me that despair comes from it being 70 degrees in D.C. in the middle of February, you know, school shooting after school shooting, so much public violence. And so I think with that despair comes this sense of why do we even begin to think about so that nothing can help us, mm -hmm. right? And I sense that a lot with students in general. There's nothing, we've gone too far. It's almost like we are over the cliff and there's nothing, there's nothing that we can do to bring it back. And I think as scholars who are engaged in this kind of work, we have to, you know, be the people who will present some idea of what those solutions could be. That's very hard work, right? And it's not, this is the work yeah. where, you know, you were saying Lonnie would walk away from conversation. If it was, you know, about nonsense, sometimes it's easier to just say, okay, uh, right. it's time to talk about, you know, I don't know, the latest movie or something, else, because yeah. things are really... Yeah, and you do bleak. need a break. Lonnie didn't yeah. apparently need a break, but yeah, you things know, are yeah. No, no, that's true. That's true. But you know, it's really interesting, interesting problem because um, I think that there's there's no question that we need to find you know what we think of as sort of solutions right. or uplifting examples of people mm -hmm. battling. But you know, I have a very mm -hmm. sort of twisted sense of what is inspiring, and right. I, I guess one of the things I guess I would say is how has our need, our definition of what is inspiring, how has it been shaped by a kind of commercial vision of, or a Hollywood arc mm. of perfect, cheerful resolution mm -hmm. of I won or things are fine? Like the real world doesn't happen that way. Forget race, before the category of race, there were, you know, people died all, every day, all day, and problems didn't get solved, and people fought for what they, you know what I mean? This is the struggle of, of, of human beings, and, and non-human beings in the animal world, like just stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So part of it is like, what do we need to be inspired of, by? What constitutes our investment in inspiration? Mm -hmm. So for me, my twisted sense of inspiration is that when I see how something's working, I immediately treat that as the precursor to any solution. 
So for me, the, 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 the vision to be able to say, oh, this whole thing's been created, it fits together this way, this way, this way. Oh, no wonder these things are happening. No wonder, no wonder, no. So that, I find that super exciting. Now everyone else is like, dang, this world is horrible. I'm like, well, it, it was the <laughs> same world yesterday. Right. You just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So now you're actually closer to figuring it out. For me, that's the beginning. Because then you start seeing, well, where are the real levers? Where are the connections? Where are the places where we can break this problem open? And then the other thing is to turn away from the narratives that force you into a sense of despair and impossibility that are largely crafted to tell you that you can't change people, you can't make things different, when in fact they are crafting, mm -hmm. right, this challenge that you were just describing in, in Florida is crafting an intractable and ignorant whiteness, right, intentionally. Mm -hmm. It's creating it. And that's why, again, I think by opening up what's happening, I'm hoping that I can say, well, look, we can all be, we can be politically, racially harmonious. You know, census might say something else, but, but, but politically, I think that's possible. So to me, it's about harnessing, like, what do we need to be inspired by, right? Me, you know, and, and just one other thing, it could mean telling stories about the amazing people who've come before which we need to do more of, oh, right? Absolutely. Academia has left the kind of, mm -hmm. let's talk about Rosa Parks. Well, you know, that can, people need to feel like somebody did something. Oh, into absolutely. Some, you know what I mean? Like, we still need that yeah. kind of storytelling. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the people who I love to tell stories about all the time, well, I love, you know, in the Howard context, I'm always telling stories about people who are connected to Howard. One of my favorite people to do that with now is Polly Murray. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I discovered Polly largely when I came to Howard but what for me is she, you know, Polly was someone who saw this problem of what she, what Polly called Jim and Jane Crow, mm -hmm. but then of course did not see them as disconnected, but saw them as interconnected mm -hmm. in a right. way that was really a precursor to the way that we think about intersectionality now. Mm -hmm. And the solutions that she was providing were largely discredited by her professors at Howard, including Spotswood Robinson, who is a really famous civil rights lawyer, who told her she was going to fail her final paper if she continued to press this idea um, that Jim Crow segregation was inherently unconstitutional, which is what she wrote in her third year paper. He told her it was such a ludicrous solution to the constitutional problem that she was going to fail her class. And instead, she took a chance and said, you may fail me, but this is the idea that will solve this problem. And eventually, they ripped off the whole idea and put it in the, put it in the brief for Brown versus Board of Education. Mm. But mm -hmm. if someone, if she had taken that notion that there was no solution, right, even though her professors didn't have the solution, they were litigating all these cases. right? If they didn't have the solution, there was no solution. Instead, she thought, you know what? I might have the solution, even though this whole right. group of people are telling me that it doesn't exist. And so I love this idea that we should be telling stories. To me, telling Polly's story all the time gives me a sense of those were problems that really seemed right. intractable. That right. she didn't see that way. Right. Right, and it also she owned and claimed the yes. constitutional framework, exactly. right, and and still mm -hmm. said, you know, I'm going to yeah. own it and break it up, right, exactly. which is a different. It's not just I'm going to create something else mm -hmm. in my own world. Right. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question, and then I think we have a break, and then another session. So, is there anyone with a final um, sort of comment question? I think we have one, and anyone else just before? I don't want to. Okay, great. Hi, good afternoon. Juana good afternoon. Parino. My question is more personal in nature. It sounds like Lonnie Guineer, this accomplished scholar, was also a torchbearer of sorts and lighted your torches and many of the distinguished guests we have here today. How do you ensure with everything that's happening, we're not worried about those who are seeking to extinguish your torches. How do you ensure that you keep it bright and lit. What do you do for yourself to ensure that, as you mentioned, it's an exhausting process, that you don't get exhausted to the point where you drop the torch? Oh, Lord, don't look over here. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, ooh, tell us. I yes, do not yes. have a good answer to this question. <laughs> it's asked every 
few months, yes. and my answers are terrible uh, for it. So I'm going to let you go first and try to come up with something you know, honestly, beyond my, what I have I, right now. You know, it's so funny because I this whole idea, and you know, Crystal was talking about it earlier. I think something early in my career that I'm glad that we've let go of is this idea that you have to show up in spaces very different from who you are. I think letting go of mm -hmm. that can let you be free mm -hmm. of a lot of that exhaustion. So number one, I definitely adopt that attitude. I show up as the same person all the time. I, you know, with my students, I ask them to, you know, teach me who Lil Uzi Vert is. You notice I said Lil Uzi Vert, not Little. Uzi Vert, yes, right. I, <laughs> so that I learned the language of my students because they have fun, right? I want to. That's part of the reason I, that I enjoy teaching is being mm -hmm. with students. I don't want to let go of the things that make me happiest about mm -hmm. um, about the work that I do. I think the other thing. So definitely show up as who you are. I think that if you don't, it's exhausting. It's not worth it. Whatever, whoever that is, and sometimes you know you have to relearn it. Because the sometimes our education, the, our responsibilities, it can really kind of take it out of you to the point where you have to relearn mm -hmm. um, some of it and reclaim it. But I would say once you have to, you know, not ever separate yourself from that, from that core of who you are and that <laughs> purpose. And the other thing I would say is just that it is. Um, I think it's really important to choose to do something that feeds you. To me, sitting here today, listening to, you know, to that incredible conversation with Ruth and Crystal, listening um, to Dr. Carter, it to me that those are the kinds of things that feed me. The same things don't feed everyone, right? right. The same things don't make you know everyone mm -hmm. feel rejuvenated. That was enough for me to go on for probably the next year. I'll be thinking about that mm -hmm. because it was, you know, the people who I most admire who are making an impact in the world, seeing the things that they are able to do in their clarity of spirit, clarity of mind, that those are the things that feed me. And you need to figure out, I tell all students, what are the things that feed you? Mm -hmm. there, for some people, it's, you know, a week at, that they spend at the beach every year. For others, it is getting, you know, a concentrated 10 hours to work on their core, you know, on the work that's most important to them. Mm -hmm. um, it's a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord. It's they, a, don't give a, yes. they don't give enough of those out. Exactly. <laughs> but figure out <clears throat> what yeah. that is and then mm -hmm. never abandon it. Yeah. And don't let people try to convince you to abandon it because lots mm -hmm. of people will say, oh, you're doing that again or you went on another vacation or you whatever. Mm -hmm. And they'll try to convince you that those things aren't important. And yeah. I think it's so it's just critical to hold on to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess to augment uh, just with two things. One is, um, you know, y you really have to create a structure in your life that is nourishing that is not about work. I mean, I want to just say, if it is 10 hours of work, that I'm trying to say not that. I'm saying it has to be something about, you know, genuine self-care, right? Eating right, sleeping right, you know, taking care of yourself, deciding who you're going to spend your time with, right? And being pretty sort of, um, you know, harsh about it. Like, just because people want to spend time with you does not mean you want to spend time with them. Because it really is energy drain. I mean, it just can be, and that's really exhausting over long periods of time. The other thing is to disengage. For me, it's about trying to create separation between the work and the energy it takes and the emotional and physical uh, uh, stress it can produce and to really decide your whole life doesn't have to be consumed by that to make a contribution, to do things that are not about this work. Because one of the things the work does is you're fighting a system that's trying to reduce your humanity in one way or another. And that means also asking you to see yourself as a racial person, as a gendered person. That is one or two of the things we all are. We're all so much more complicated than these categories allow us to really represent. And so making room for that is both nourishing, but it also separates you and your fullness and richness from the narrowing and constraining sort of presentations of evidence and information along the axes that they want to force you into. They here is a very, you know, yes. you know loose here, very right. loose in quote.
quotes. So even the people who are finding solutions when they're talking to people who are giving solutions, that is a, can be a form of draining and narrowing of who we are. So remembering that we're all bigger and more complex and not limited to the categories that people are trying to put us in is really at the heart of, of you know, a lot of the way that I try to think about my own health. Although I will say, I have certainly failed over years. No, it, it's exhausting, and you know you can feel it, you know, as you get older, so to speak. <laughs> um, but you know, you know, and you, you know, that's, that's those are my two pieces of advice. It's very hard to do, but just keep trying because uh, it will be hard, harder than you think. Just keep trying. Yeah. Thank you for that. We really are so grateful that you all came. Thank you so so yes. much for, for being part of this. And thank you, Danielle. Thank Welcome you. to Brown. Thank you.